Oh, give him praise. Give him praise. The joy of the Lord. Come on. Hey, just stay standing with us just for a few minutes. Man, we are so excited to have you in the house, people joining line. Uh, down at our water, over Watertown, North Judson, Heber today, we got everything packed together. We're going to fulfill all the scripture. Jesus may come before this service is over. I'm just telling you. We got, we got worship. We're going to baptize. We're going to preach. We got communion. It just may be the day the clouds open up. So just get ready. It's exciting. Man, we're always rejoicing when we get to have people that follow the Lord in water baptism. Water baptism doesn't save you, but it's a proclamation. It's an identification that I identify with Christ. I publicly declare that He is my Lord and my Savior. And we have youth, and we have children, and we have adults. I want to invite everybody that's going to be baptized, come on down front with me if you would, and just make it across here. Pastor Matt's going to take it over. Come on, we and, got quite uh, a few people. Come on, Harlan, make some noise for... I know we got some others coming. We got some others still changing, Pastor. Uh, they just showed up. Pastor Daniel and his crew uh, from the Spanish church will be here as well. And uh, I got one quick. Can I share Come one on, quick share. story? Yep. And you know what? He said we're doing baptism and communion. I think we got the water ready. We should go old school and foot washing today as well. And just Woo! do all three. <laughs> yeah. Nasty feet. No. Listen, some of y'all. Some of y'all heard last week an amazing story from Fall Retreat, Pastor. And this is Brooklyn right here. If y'all remember Brooklyn's story, there's Brooklyn. But what was so awesome is while we was at Fall Retreat, some of y'all didn't know this. We're hanging out and we're talking in tribes. And she starts talking about a friend. And she says, uh, and she mentions this friend, Maisie. And she says, if we could pray for Maisie, because I've been working on Maisie. And I've been trying to witness to Maisie about Christ and who God is. And so we prayed for Maisie right there on Saturday. And then Wednesday, I get a text from Brooklyn. She goes, Pastor Matt, you'll never guess what just happened. She's like, I was sitting in the lunchroom, and we started talking. She goes, and Maisie's like, right there. She's like, I'm ready. I'm going to surrender my life to God. Y'all, that's Maisie right there. She's like, Maisie's going to show up to church with me on Sunday. And uh, listen, we talk about all the time. Hey, we want you to go, go get your people saved yourself and just bring them to church. Come Here's on. a young lady doing it right there, doing the work of the Lord. And Maisie's here today to celebrate. It's going to be a great day, Heartland family. Come on, we're going to celebrate in water baptism. We need a, a group photo. Yeah. That's Pastor Daniel and his crew. Come on, Pastor. Come on down front. Come on, y'all can make some noise. We got some other yeah, people joining us. So we're going to get a group photo. Where's Pastor at? I saw him walk in. Pastor Daniel. The lights. There he yeah. is. He's Pastor coming. Daniel's coming. Y'all squeeze in like we love each other. Come on, squeeze Come on. in like we love each other. We're going to get a good photo. Squeeze in like we love each other. There's Pastor hey, coming. Hey, would you, would you welcome Pastor Daniel? He is in a uh, Hispanic church over in Chicago area that we've been networking for the last several years. We give him some support. We give him some encouragement, and we appreciate what God's doing. Is everybody in the photo? Is everybody in it? Right, come on, I'm going I'm to photo bomb right here. Come on. Awesome. Come on, would you give the Lord one more hand clap? Hey, we're going to keep worshiping. You guys follow Pastor Matt over there. We're going to get you lined up. We got some kids. We got some youth. We got some adults. Pastor Daniel is going to baptize uh, some of his folk from, uh, from his church over in Chicago. And hey, they're going to keep worshiping. So would you just get, continue to worship? celebrate when you see them go down and come up would you just give a good hand clap and worship with them today go ahead pastor lindsay Lord, 
for these parents, these parents that are teaching their children, leading their children. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord.
Father, thank you for these testimonies of triumph and victory. Yeah. Down with the old, up with the new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Thank you.
testimonies, God. What a God, what a God. Thank you for these testimonies, Lord. Thank you for these testimonies. God, we just thank you. Thank you, God. Come on, come on, tell him. Come on. He's worthy. Hallelujah. How great is our God. You're the name, Lord. <laughs> You're the name Thank you for transformation, God. God, thank you for transformation. Yeah, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Come on, just lift your hand. Would you? Come on, all on the campus and just lift your hand. How great. You. Come on, give him praise. Come on, come on, give him a good hand clap. God's doing great things in people's lives. This is what it's like to be a part of a church that's alive. Amen? Church is alive. It's got newcomers coming to Christ. Transformation from kids, youth, adults. Come on, would you just bow your heads, Father? We are so thankful. God, you do amazing things marvelous things in our midst and thank you God that you are letting us be a part of that we get to see it experience it Lord we can testify to life changes happening God we just thank you today we pray blessings over these families over these commitments that are being made today God life change is happening at Wadata and North Johnson and Hebron and here at Valpo God we thank you for that and we bless you today. We pray for our nation. We pray for our country. We bless this nation right now, God. Political unrest. We bless it, God. We ask you, God, to continue to guide and direct hearts. God, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray for the Middle East. We pray, God, that you will keep your hand in your guidance there. And we honor you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, high five somebody. And say, it's exciting today. Come on. It's exciting. You may be seated for just a couple of minutes. Ushers are going to get ready. And uh, we're going to honor the Lord today with stewardship. Pastor Daniel, again, it's great to have you and some of your people with us today. Thank you so much. Appreciate your labor, your work. Just a, a couple of years, a year or so ago, Pastor Daniel had tremendous sickness and battle. And God brought him up out of the deathbed because it wasn't looking good for him. Man, I'm thankful that God spared you. And man, the love that you have for that city and that community, the Hispanic community there that you're reaching. Thank you, buddy. God bless you so, so very much. Would you give the Lord just a good praise for Pastor Daniel? And man, what God is doing. Just some amazing things. Hey, if, if you're a parent, grandparent this afternoon, uh, we have... Uh, some Fall Fest happening at our Wanita campus, at our Hebron campus, uh, 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. We got hay rides, we got bounce houses, we got a uh, car show, we got hot dogs, we got a good family time. Bring your kids out over to Wanita or the Hebron campus. You're welcome to join us. Last year, we had a tremendous time over there with our community. We're just loving them. This is one of those communities where we just invite people in. Everything's free of charge. It doesn't cost you anything. And we just love on our community. We invite you to come and bring your kids, bring your grandkids, and enjoy an afternoon. Hey, next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating uh, 76 years as a church and uh, 24 years. Uh, pastor Rhonda and I have been able to be the senior pastor of this great church. And we love what God has done in the last 24 years, the last 76 years see the impact that we're having around this nation. We invite you to come back next week. We're going to have a little reception area set up over here in the, in the uh, uh, Genesis area where we can meet and greet and kind of uh, be able to share a little bit. We'd love for you to come and 
bring somebody with you. Come celebrate. You know, church is closing down every day around this nation. We must celebrate the goodness that God's been to this church, the faithfulness. Pastor Matt talked about it last week, the legacy that this church has with it, and you're part of it going forward in the future, and uh, we love to celebrate that. We've got some great friends of ours, Alan and Anush Bullock. They'll be with us. You'll, you'll be blessed by Alan, Dr. Allen's ministry, just a great friend. He's just been a great evangelist and worked with Teen Challenge for years, directed Teen Challenge in the state of Alabama and other areas. And uh, they have a tremendous ministry. You'll love Sister Anush and her story and uh, the victory, the triumph that God brought her through. So it's just going to be a great Sunday next Sunday. So plan, be here 815, 945 at this campus, 10 o'clock at Wadato and uh, Hebron, and then 830 and 10 o'clock down at the North Johnson campus. Hey, would you stand with me? Let's get ready to honor the Lord today in our stewardship. And we thank you for just being faithful of what you're doing. Today's Mission Sunday, we, we try to emphasize once a month that uh, all these flags you see flying, the missionary emphasis that we have, the missionaries that we have serving in countries and nation. So you're part of a church that we're not just impacting Northwest Indiana, but we're impacting this world because that's, that's the heart of God, right? A great commitment to the Great Commission is what makes a great church. And this church is committed to help get the gospel around the world. Even though we can't physically go there, we have missionaries strategically placed in nations and countries around. It's the reason why we have all these flags posted, because we want you to see we believe in the Great Commission and what God is doing. So beyond your tithe, we talk to you about tithes and offerings and alms. Beyond your tithe, would you give an offering today towards our mission project? Help us to continue to impact and support these missionaries. And we know that God will bless you for that. Let me pray. Father, just thank you so much today for what you're doing in our church. We celebrate new life. We celebrate decisions that are being made and disciples that are being created. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for a church that has a mission for this world. God, not just our community. Yes, we love our community. We love Northwest Indiana. But Father, we know your heart is the world. God so loved the world. And Father, we thank you today that we're part of that. And we give to you today, not grudgingly, not haphazardly. We give to you because we love you. And we know your blessing is upon our people today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hey, bless you. Would you worship Lord? Hey, here's a brand new song. I asked the team to do it today. We've been talking about I love my church. Jesus is building a great church. Worship, and then we're coming back with a message today. The Lord, our chief cornerstone, no other foundation can we build upon, no philosophy, no the wisdom of a man, all of the power. Say upon this rock, you build your church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. When we bind and loose, we proclaim your truth, and in
teach you this next part today. And we're going to declare that the Lord would build his church. Come on, that we would be in unity. God, we would be strong today. Come on, we're going to declare this. Come on, say, build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up with your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up. It's your church, build your church, build your church, build it up. It's your church, build your church, build your church. said in Matthew 16, he said, I'm going to build a church. And I know sometimes we look around this American culture and we see our, our community sometimes where people say, well, you know, churches don't, people don't go to church and church is going down. Let me tell you, the church that Christ is building is thriving. You understand? Listen, I read it to you just a couple weeks ago. Read the end of Revelation, Revelation 21, 22. Listen, we win. You understand? We win. We are victorious. <laughs> We're victorious. And I know sometimes it, it, we, we, we look at through our small lens of this American culture. We look through our small lens. And we think, wow, you know, people don't go to church. And the church is going down. And no, no, listen, Christ's church is going up. And what you and I have to understand is that what he's doing is bigger than us. We're part of it. But he said the gates of hell will not prevail. What I love about Heartland is we're not a church that just sits back and said, Okay, God, you send them. This church is all about how can we go? How can we reach out? The events that we're doing this afternoon at campus, it's about community. It's about loving people, going to where they're at showing Jesus in their life. And I just want us today, to show, would you join hands, and would you just, as we start to get ready to minister today, would you just pray for the person to your right or to your left, and say, God, help us to realize how important we are to your big plan. Because you have one, Father. God, I ask you today, in this room, those watching at our campuses today at North Judson and Hebron and Watertown and Westville. God, help us to realize how important we are to your big plan. Your plan wins. Your plan succeeds. Your plan is victorious because it's your church that you're building. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, one more time. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us. If you're a guest today, we welcome you. So glad that you're here.
We're going to ask the Lord to help this group of people over here that didn't show up. All their seats are empty today. But that's the group that's on vacation right now. I love this church because, listen, every week we, we have a new crop of people that shows up. There's a few, uh, a few of us that show up every week, but then we see people we don't see. And we're just glad, so glad that you're here. And you know, all this month we've been in this series that we've took some time just to talk about how I love my church. You see all these photos on the walls here on the north and over here on the west side, all these pictures. This is just a portion of our church family. Because we talk about we love the church. We're not talking about we love a building. I, I appreciate our building. Our building has a message to our community. You know, you'll be surprised when I'm in business meetings or out in community meetings and people recognize who I am. And I've been here 24 years now, so a lot of people know who I am. But immediately, so many times, people will go to me and talk about how beautiful our property is. Oh, you guys do such a great job with your churches and your campuses. And listen, that's a message in itself, isn't it? And we should take pride in taking care of our church. When we talk about the church, we're not talking about this facade. We're not talking about Wanata or North Judson or Hebron's building. We're talking about the people that's in the church. We're talking about the person sitting beside you. Talking about the person behind you, in front of you. We're talking about the person that you know their name and the person that you don't know their name. We love our church. And this morning, I want to talk to you about the myth that so many people will have in their mind that if I have God, I don't need people. Hey, pastor, if, if I have God in my life, this, this, this mindset, this, this mindset that me and God syndrome, the me and God syndrome says things like, well, you know, Christ is enough. You know, it's just me and God against the world. You know, when I got God on my side, I can, I can lick whatever problem that I have. Or so many people say, you may be, well, God is a pilot and I'm the co-pilot. Have you ever heard that? That this mindset that, that uh, it's just me and God. Well, here's the problem with that. That, that. that mindset comes from a false thought about the sufficiency of Christ. The doctrine of the sufficiency of Christ. And here's what Paul writes in Colossians 2 and 9. I love this verse. But so many people misunderstand this verse. He says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Now listen, if, if, you, if you read that verse of Scripture, so many people say, well, you know, Pastor, that proves that, that Christ is everything that you need. He provides fully for us, physically, spiritually, emotionally. He, you know, that, that's all you, you need. But here's the problem, and here's what we're going to kind of navigate through. When we interpret Christ's sufficiency as Christ alone, then we're not including his resources. Listen, we're not including his resources. Now, here's the problem we have in the American culture. We have so many people who come to Christ, who, who, who they want to go to heaven when they die. They, 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 want, to, they want to get an eternal reward from God. And, and that's, I love that. I, that. That's ultimately what Christ does for us. He brings us back into that right relationship with the Lord. But what happens is, those same people run into problems when they think that prayer and Bible reading is all that I need to do to be able to be a successful Christian. Well, you know, all I need to do is read the Bible. I, all I need to do is just pray. And whenever I have a problem, whenever I'm feeling anxious or I have fear in my life, listen, all I need to do, it can be solved. Every one of my problems can be solved with more time alone with God. You ever, you ever heard people that think that? Some people are not here today because they think that. They, they simply believe that, hey, I can navigate in this broken world, in this broken life, as long as I have God on my side, then I don't need people. But listen, what, what happens is we negate of not understanding the resources that God has. So here, write this down. Oftentimes with this mindset, me and God, 
we often feel like if you go to people for your spiritual emotional needs, well, you're wrong. Hey, you got God, Pastor Phil. Why, why do you need somebody else in your life? You, maybe, maybe you don't have enough faith. You, you, ever, you ever run into somebody that made you feel like you didn't have enough faith because you couldn't get through that problem with just you and God? Come on. It's just us. Let's just be honest. You, you, ever, you ever had people that made you feel like that somehow or another you've got a small or limited view of God? If you, if you somehow or another feel like that you need somebody else to come along beside you and help you in your journey of life? Listen, can I tell you, the enemy is often successful in our culture of creating a mindset that is somehow or another, I, I accepted Christ as my Savior, I got baptized, and somehow or another, if I need other people in my life, then it's just because I'm a weak Christian. And here's the problem. It's wrong. It, it doesn't involve with the fact of how God wants to work in our life. Now people say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor. Isn't God sufficient? I mean, don't you, don't you believe that God can do anything and everything? Listen, I, I understand the concept God can do anything. But listen, here's the fact. He doesn't do everything. Hello? When I got ready to come to church early this morning, 5 o'clock, I get in my truck. I didn't cross my arm and say, okay, God, get me there. I want to go to church. I, 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 I need you to drive me. God didn't drive me to church. Hello? I needed to do something to get to church. And listen, listen, God doesn't tell your kids how much you love them. God doesn't tell your spouse how much you love them. God doesn't water your grass unless you live in Seattle. But God doesn't do that. Hello? Some of you might get that. You know? Well, what, what I'm saying is, listen, the fact is, write this down. God uses all sorts of resources to help us in life. And that's what we have to understand about the church. The church, not the building, but the church, is about coming to Christ. Yes, He's sufficient. Yes, He went to the cross. We'll talk about that. But listen, in the midst of what Christ wants to do in the church, He has all kinds of resources that you and I can discover in our journey and in our walk with Christ. Amen. See, some of us, Forget about the fact that the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 1 and 14 that God uses His angels as ministering spirits sent to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation. You understand, God Himself, angels are created beings. They're, they're not reincarnated human beings, okay? Bless your little mama's heart, your grandma's heart. When she died, she didn't become an angel. Angels are created beings of God. Man was created by God. Angels, the Bible teaches us all through the Bible that God uses his angels as ministering spirits. You understand probably most of us in this room do not even comprehend how many times that it was God's ministering angels that kept his hand upon you and kept you from getting into trouble. God's ministering angels. The Bible said the angel of the Lord encamp around about those who fear him. Now listen, if I think it's just me and God and I don't need nobody else, listen, so many times I'm going to negate the fact that there are times in my life when I need, I need God to show up and sometimes he shows up with one of his warring angels to fight my battles for me. Come on, somebody help me. Sometimes God will step into a situation when it seems like the enemy's about to pound me and get me down. God's angel will show up and deliverance will come my way. Woo! Sometimes he does it driving down the road. And that accident that you just, oh man, I just... Boy, I got lucky there. Could be God's angel. Hello? When we negate the fact God has all kinds of resources. Matter of fact, Psalms 19 and 1 said, The heavens declare the glory, the skies proclaim the work of His hand. You understand, if, if I think it's just me and God, then I can, I can overlook the fact that, hey, maybe there's an angel God has you. Maybe there's times, listen, there's been times in my life 
when, when I'm battling something, I'm going through something, I'm trying to navigate a, a circumstance in my life that I can get on my motorcycle and as I just start riding, I love to ride at night, I know it's not a safety at night, but I love and just look up and see the star and just see the heavens declaring the glory of God. You understand God uses that? Now, he don't want us to be nature worshipers. He don't want us to be angel worshipers. But oftentimes, if we believe that it's just God and me, then we negate the fact, wait a minute, God's got these resources. Sometimes he uses angels. Sometimes he uses nature. Listen, in Numbers chapter 22, God used a donkey to talk to Balaam. He may be using one right now. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm preaching, some of you look like, that's a big old donkey. <laughs> but you do understand this is one of his modes of helping you in your journey. Is when a pastor teaches from the Word of God, helps you kind of refocus your, 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 your mindset on, hey, listen, God's interested in you. Yes, he is. But listen, God is using this source Listen, God alone, yes, he's the source of my grace and this undeserved love. But listen, we have to look to people. People are often time in which God demonstrates his grace through the people around us. I love what Paul says. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. This, this past week, you know, falls here. We start, we start trimming all the bushes around the church and, you know, pastors are, or we, you know, we got scheduled. So we have somebody that comes in to help us, some, some young people that comes in and helps us. And, uh, you know, we, we've got some shrubs and stuff and I knew I wasn't going to have time. We got some guests coming in and I thought, well, I'm just going to hire this person. So I hired him and he come in, he's cutting all my, all my shrubs and getting everything, you know, cut down for the winter time and, and stuff. And Miss Rhonda asked me, she said, what about my pecan tree? Oh, pecan tree. Now, let me tell you the story. She has an uncle that has now passed away. They gave her a pecan tree two years ago and said, if you bring it to northwest Indiana, you plant it with this other little, little bush, keep them two together, that pecan tree will grow. And guess what? It was about knee high. And as soon as she said, what about my pecan tree? Listen, I'm getting ready to repent because I'm knowing it ain't looking good. So I said, just one minute, let me go out there. I went out there, and lo and behold, there's no pecan tree. It's cut. It's gone. It's a little stub sticking up. And I come back in, and I said, honey, please forget. It's all my thought. Now, listen, I'm hiding all the sharp objects. I'm making sure my gun's locked up. Because, listen, I know she knows the church has trouble forgiving divorce, but she knows she can get forgiveness for murder pretty quick. So <laughs> if I ever come up missing, please search hard. I I tell my kids, search. Don't give up too easy. But now listen, I needed grace. You understand? That meant something. And I'm telling her it's going to come back. I'm telling her, hey, listen, it's just cut down. It's just like it's been pruned. <laughs> it's cut down. Oh, it's pruned. I'm promising to buy her another one. I'm doing all this stuff. And she looks at me, and just for a few minutes, she stays upset. And Sunshine does like us when we, when we get in intense fellowship. And she, she comes back, she said, listen, I love you, and I forgive you. you. You understand how important it is to get grace from other people in our lives? Yeah, yeah, I know God, because listen, I had no ill intentions. Listen, I wasn't trying to deliberately, I just simply forgot to tell the young man, there is a pecan tree out there, do not cut it down. It was totally my fault. But listen, Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 7, but to each one of us, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. How does God often do that? He gives it through people. There's some of you sitting in this room today right now. Your life is not what it needs to be. Your life is not moving the way God wants it to move. Simply because you don't realize how important it is for God to appropriate grace to you through another individual. If you don't recognize God's grace to other people, your perception of God's too small. 
Because oftentimes we forget about the cross. We forget about the sacrifice. We forget about. But when you know you've messed up in your marriage or with your kids. And your kids can look at you and say, Dad, I forgive you. Mom, I forgive you. Or your spouse says, that's okay. I forgive you. I give you grace. And you understand how much that, that adds value in our life. So we miss God's resources. So write this down. Listen, when, when we think. If I have a God, I don't need people. It denies that God uses people to meet the needs of others. It denies that. It forgets about the fact, yes, thank God, thank you, but there's times I need God with skin on. That make sense? There's times when I need God to show up in my life, and I need to have a physical form. And when you and I recognize that God uses people, th- think about this in Genesis chapter 2. When, when God, God is coming down in the cool of the day, in the afternoon, he's having, the Bible says he walked with Adam. Adam had communion with the Father. He had communion with God in the garden. He had the entire garden. And God looks at Adam and said, Adam, it's not good that you be alone. And he created a hope me through, through his rib, right? Come on, you know the story. Can, can, can you, wait a minute. Yeah, Adam, you, you've got God. Isn't God enough? God says no. Adam had the animals. He had the garden. But he knew Adam needed another human being. You and I are the same way in this Christ journey. We cannot do this Christ journey by ourselves. We cannot handle the battles that we face, the fear, the anxiety, the oppression, the depression that comes against us. Listen, we need other people. God constantly gives us references in the Bible about one another. I don't even have time to give you all of them, but serve one another in Galatians 5. Love one another in 1 Peter 1, 22. To be devoted to one another, Romans 12. Consider how we spur one another towards love and good deeds, Hebrews 10. We know that we pass from death from life because we love one another. What's your point, Pat? My point is simply that, that God often chooses to meet our needs. Yeah, sometimes miraculously. Sometimes it's an angel. Sometimes I can look around and it's nature that pulls me back into, into tune. But sometimes I just need another person to come along beside me. That makes sense? Now it doesn't, now listen, lest we get confused, right? This out. God isn't limited to people. Because he's always highly personally involved in all of our lives. Now I want you to, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying God is limited to his angels. He's limited to just an angel. He's limited to, to, no. God is highly involved in our life. But many, many times we don't see God unless we can see God through somebody else. I was at one of our campuses this week, and after the service, this guy was coming up to me, and he's excited, and he's sharing this story, this triumphant story, this victory story that God had. And with right standing in the auditorium, he drops the F-bomb three times, okay? And he's just excited, and, he, and his, his wife punches, you can't say that. And he looks at me like, well, Patrick, and I said, tell me the story, Okay? Yeah, God's working on your language. Listen, God's working on your language. Tell me the rest of the story. If I would have looked at him like, oh, lightning's going to come down. No, he needed somebody to show him grace, right? Come on. I don't use that language. I don't talk that way. But listen, there's times that people will be put in our life and they need somebody that's going to show up and we're going to be God with skin on and we're going to love them just where they are. I was there Sunday after I was there last Sunday. I went over there to close the second service. Uh, Pastor Matt was preaching, so I went over there because we had a volunteer. And after the service, this same guy, he brought us. I, I said, hey, listen, if you're here and I've never met you because we have people that come on Sunday that don't come on Thursday. I said, I'm going to hang out. You come up here. And, and he brought these two guys up here. And this guy said, high five. This guy's been telling me about. And he drops the F-bomb three times. I said, Okay. They kind of go in the same stream. 
But I, did, I, didn't, I didn't get shocked. I, didn't, I just stood there. I said, really? Man, it's so awesome to meet you. What are you saying, Pastor? You need friends who drop the F bomb. No, that's not the that's not where I'm going, okay? I'm saying you need to be God with skin on sometimes. And the only way to do that is understand that God will use us. We're part of the resource. That's how the church is put together. We're bodily formed. So what's this? Four things, real quick. I'm going to move to how how do we clarify our thinking on this? When I look at our culture right now, when I see what's going on, there's four areas that we truly need to be supporting each other like never before. It's, it's growth, comfort, wisdom, and repair. So let me, let me just hang out here. Listen, most Christ followers, most Christians that I meet today, they want to grow spiritually. Most people that I talk to in the church, outside of the church, they will tell me, you know, Pastor Phil, uh, I've come to Christ, this guy that's, uh, listen, his heart, oh, pray for me, Pastor. I, I, know, I know God needs to do more. But listen, he's on the right track. Most people want to, to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. But oftentimes, the only one, the only way that can happen, their, their growth can, can only take place when they have people in their lives that will speak truth to them. But speak truth to them in love. Look, look at what Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 15. He says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up. Everybody say, grow up. Into him who is the head that is Christ. Okay? So that's where we all headed. We're, 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 we're image barriers of him. We want to grow up in him. For, in, for from him, the whole body joined and held together. By every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now what's this? Underline that every supporting ligament. What is that? Listen, that is God said it takes the entire body of Christ. We, we all play a crucial role in our spiritual growth. That's the reason why you got people in your life right now that are absolutely EGRs. They need extra grace required. And instead of God just taking them out of your life, He's allowed them to be in your life because He wants you to grow in your grace. Hello? If you're just always around nice people like you are, you ever get challenged with just nice people? Who do you get challenged with? Knuckleheads. Hello. Don't raise your hand too high. They may be sitting next to you. But just, you, you get challenged, but challenging people. You, you, you don't learn patience from people that are patient. You know where you learn patience from? Impatient people. That's where you learn patience from. It's the reason why sometimes when, when people in their life, instead of you saying, God, I want to get in a different small group, these people get on my nerves. And God is simply saying, I, want, I don't want them to get on your nerves. I'm trying to let them get on your heart. Because you need to learn something from them. They're not where you are yet. Stop looking down your nose as if you've arrived and they haven't. Reach back. Come on. Reach back and help them grow. So, so we need people, and God uses people. He uses sermons. He uses the Bible. He uses prayer. Yes, yeah, but He uses people to do what? To help us grow. Here's the second thing. Listen, God uses people to help us with our comfort. When I, when I talk to people today, listen, one of the basic spiritual emotional needs that almost every person that I engage with right now in conversation is they need some comfort. Listen, there's enough fear and, uh, fear and panic happening in the world today, right? Come on. You don't want to go to a doctor and, and you know, and he comes out of a, uh, do your checkup and said, oh my God, oh my God, I don't know what we're going to do. You're, you're very, listen, I didn't, listen, no, lie to me, tell me everything's going to be okay. Hello. You know, you, you, you may be honest with your nurse. Come out there and give me some comfort. You follow me? The church 
is in the ideal position and place right now. The world is needing to be comforted. The world is needing somebody to step up. Yeah, it looks like this politically. It looks like this economically. But guess what? We serve a God that is able. We're not the first generation to be facing a Red Sea in front of us and Pharaoh's army behind us. You understand? We're not the first generation to be facing an economic stress. Nobody, listen, I don't like to pay high price for fuel or food. You know, I'm still trying to negotiate to get all my sweets back in the house. Miss Rhonda said, well, they're too expensive. Let me do without body deodorant or something. Give me, you know, I spray enough cologne to cover up. No, no, but nobody likes to, we, we don't want to never, but this is what we're being given. How would it happen? What would happen if you and I could stand in the midst of this world and say, yeah, but there is a God who has unfailing love that will comfort us in troubled times. You can get through this. You can navigate this. The New Testament, the early church had the comfort of the Holy Spirit in Acts 9 and 31. Listen, comfort is important. Sometimes the best thing we can say to people, how can I help? How can I help? Somebody's asking me this week, hey, Pastor, will I say this is the most important election that we've ever had? Yes. Last four years was the most important life. The four years before that, every election is important. You understand that? The next four years at the Lord Terrace will be the most important election. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God for direction. And I'm going to vote. And after I prayed and I vote, I'm going to relax. Because I know my hope and my help isn't going to come from Washington, D.C. It isn't coming from the donkey, nor what else? What is that? The elephant. There you go. Got some Republicans in the house. Uh, my help's coming from the lamb and the lion. You follow me? And that's the comfort that sometimes our world needs, needs to experience today. I, I love this story, and I don't even have time. But in Genesis 37, 25, when Jacob thought his favorite son, Joseph, had died. You know, Jacob had sons, and Joseph was his favorite, and he got sold into slavery. Some of you know the story. If you don't, read the story. The Bible said that when Jacob thought his son had died, all of his sons and daughters came to comfort him. But which He refused to be comforted. He said, No. In mourning, I will go down to the grave to my son. Now, now this is an important passage that shows the power of comfort in, 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 in our human life when it comes to healing. Jacob's children knew that he was mourning. He knew that he felt great loss. And they come to him and they wanted to comfort him. But Jacob refused the comfort of his children. Why? Because he knew that it would promote healing, the healing process that he was grieving right now. Listen, there's, there's people in our life right now, they need comfort. And sometimes when we come to comfort them, they, they don't open their arms and say, yes, I, no. Sometimes they're just like Jacob, leave me alone. I want to be mad. I want to be angry right now. I want whatever. You know what comfort does? Comfort doesn't walk away, say, okay, good luck. Comfort stays there. And sometimes we don't say nothing. And in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their pain, we're asking God, Holy Spirit, open their heart to letting you bring healing in their life. You know, we've all, we've all heard the saying, time heals everything. You ever heard it? Time heals everything. No, it doesn't. Time seals everything. And if you, don't give, if you don't get wholeness, if you don't get closure, if you don't sometimes resolve to stop saying, not me, why me, why this, why now? If you don't resolve somehow or another to say, okay, God, what next? You will, the, the pain that you're in will be sealed and you'll be held captive with that hurt and that bondage. 
You follow me? And there's people right now that we live in a culture that the enemy is trying to put them in that prison. And they need somebody that's going to come along beside them to listen. There's hope. There's help in God. And I'm here just to be God. Be skin. God was skin on for you today. I'm here to tell you, take as long as you need to take grieving. But I'm always going to be coming back and remind you, there is a way out. You may not never get over this. Listen, you might not never get over this. But with God's help and my encouragement, you're going to get through this. You follow me? There's things that some of you in this room, some of you, you'll never get over. But with God's help and the right people along beside you, listen, you will get through this. I, I love what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2. He said, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Just a quick background. Here's a guy in the church at Corinth that had had some pretty major sins in his life. Not going to get in what there was or some speculation of that. But listen, this dude had really messed up, and, and the church had at one time excommunicated him, and he had come back and he'd asked forgiveness and he had expressed repentance. And Paul comes to them and said, Listen, you need to forgive him, you need to comfort him, lest he gets overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. Listen, can I tell you one of the greatest challenges of the church today is to help people navigate through bad choices, bad decisions that hurt them or hurt somebody else, that somehow or another they get excessive sorrow and they never can move forward with it. Yes, God forgive them, but they cannot forgive themselves. Am I preaching? Come on. They can't forgive themselves. Listen, I am absolutely pro-life. I believe the sacredness of a child in a baby's womb. But I want to tell you, over the years, Rod and I, we have helped moms navigate the horrid uh, story in their life of how do you move forward after you've had an abortion? How could I ever forgive myself when their light got turned on or they got they regathered themselves? They realized, wow, listen, it's only by the grace of God, but they need people to walk with them in that journey. Because listen, it's so easy to put constant condemnation on people. They don't need to be condemned. Let me just tell you right now by the Holy Spirit, I'll just speak this to somebody's life. Some of you have got family members and you've got people in your life that they're, they're, they're making life choices that is totally against God's Word. They're totally against your lifestyle. And because your standard is so high, they never could feel like they could ever measure up so it's sometimes it's keeping them from ever even trying. I would speak to you this morning of simply saying, don't let your standard down. Don't, don't walk away from what the Word of God said. But listen, open your heart to the point that you love people even though they've made choices and bad decisions that you don't agree with, but you refuse to hold them bondage and captive because of that. You remember what I told you? I told you a few weeks ago, one out of six family members right now are not talking to another family member because of their political divide in this country. One out of six. One, listen, do you understand, you understand Satan loves that? I don't care what. I'm getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting in trouble. I better get back to the notes here. Listen, I, I, I don't care what political side you're on. Don't allow politics. Don't allow lifestyle, behavior keep you from loving people who often already feel unlovable. You follow me? we got to have an avenue. we got to have a path. That's what this church is all about. That's what this church is. We did it with drug addicts. We did it with, with alcoholics for years. This is what this church is all about. It's how, how do we have a pathway to God? And sometimes the only way people ever find that path is a person will step up and say, don't go, but follow me as I lead you. That makes sense? Wow, let me, let me just try to get to these last two. I love a little bit of the story about Job. I don't have, you know, Job, Job had some very preachy friends. He called them, in Job 16 and 2, he called them miserable comforters. <laughs> You ever, you ever had some of those people in your life? Miserable comforters. I don't want to be like that. Listen, God uses people for growth. He uses us for comfort. He uses people for wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. 
Listen, when, when, we, when we start following Christ and we have this desire to be all that God wants us to be, part of what the church's role in doing that, how do we come along beside, not just, not just help you grow, not just to give you some comfort, but how do we help you have some wisdom of understanding? What does the Bible say? How do, how do you live that out in your life today? A lot of people struggle. Well, Pastor, I know what the Bible said, but how do I live that out? That's where the church comes involved. That's what we can get in people's lives. It's kind of like the, the, the Ethiopian that, that Philip ran into in Acts chapter 8, and he's reading the book of Isaiah, and, and Philip goes up to him and he said, you know, do you understand what you're reading? And a eunuch replied, how can I reply unless somebody explain it to me? What if Philip would have said, well, you just keep praying and reading the Bible. It'll open your eyes. No, he stopped. He took time. He opened the scripture and said, hey, let, me, let me help you understand it. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do, Proverbs 4 and 7 said. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. How many would admit today, listen, what if, what if you could not lie the next 30 seconds, okay? You, can't, you ever seen that, uh, that movie, Liar, Liar? Okay, you can't lie for the next 30 seconds. If you do, you're going to slap yourself, Okay. How many would acknowledge in this room there are still things in your life that you need some wisdom and understanding about? Okay. I'm going to wait to see if the hands go wild on some of you. <laughs> Listen. Some of, some of the best places we get wisdom and understanding is through other people. There's some of you when you have relationship problem, marriage problem. Listen, you need people in your life. Listen, it's one thing to go to the Bible and read Ephesians. Well, Paul says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And wives, submit yourselves unto your own, own husband. It's one thing to read that. You come to me and say, Pastor Phil, how do you navigate that for 50 years? Apologize. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. Does that make sense? When the Bible says, love those who, who, who come against you, pray for your enemy. It, listen, you need somebody to come along beside you and say, this is how that happens. And it's one thing to read it. When, 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 when the Bible says, give and honor the Lord with your, with your tithes and your offerings and your alms and, and you barely can make a budget, you need somebody to come along beside and say, and help teach you, this is how you put God first. That makes sense? Walk with the wise and become wise, Proverbs 13 and 2 says. Associate with fools, and man, you'll get into trouble. Most of us know that. Listen, God, God wants to set us up with wisdom, we're, we're, even when we're surrounded by foolishness sometimes. God wants us to rule over our circumstances. But sometimes it, it may be with your career. It may be with finances. It may be with anxiety disorders. It may be with the will of God. Listen, God wants to use people to give you some of that wisdom. And then one more thing. Last year, is God uses people with repair. Now again, you got this spell where you have to tell, tell the truth, okay? You can't lie, can't lie. You have to tell the truth. How many of us would acknowledge in this room that in some way we're all broken people? I wish to God some of you would just lift your hand for something. <laughs> you know I'm telling you the truth. We've either, listen, we've either sinned or we've been sinned against. Every one of us. And it, it equals that, that so many times we are broken people. None of us can ex escape the results of this broken world. We suffer spiritually. We suffer, uh, we, we suffer often emotionally, relationally. And, and the effects of our brokenness, listen, the effects of our brokenness is for some of us, we won't let others love us. We, we, we keep building up walls and barriers and won't let people in. Remember I told you a few weeks ago, majority of people have more deal friends than they have real friends. Deal friends are those friendships that we have that are all transactional. 
The only relationship I have with you is the transaction that happens. You do something, I do something. It, it may be a business transaction. It may be a, 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 you know, a, a family, but it's transactional. Very few people in our culture today know what it is to develop real friends. Why? Because we live in this broken world. And because we live in this broken world, listen, a lot of us are very good at putting on our church face and our church clothes and acting like we got it all together. And we don't. I've never in 24 years ever preached in this pulpit from a, from a mindset, listen, guys, I got this thing worked out. You know, I've still got some knuckleheads in my life that I have trouble praying for. I might surprise you, but I do. You know, I still got some pain in my life to tread the resurface from, from the past that I have to keep prayed down. And the only way sometimes I can deal with that is to have people in my life that I can talk to and share. You, you, does that make sense? Amen. And God designed, listen, but because we're broken, and listen, there, there should be no shame in that. I'm not going to ask you to tell what your brokenness is. But, 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 but the, the confession is, because of our brokenness, listen, sometimes we struggle of connecting with people. And because we struggle with connecting with people and having real friends, whether it be a small group, whether it be uh, uh, in, in a setting where you're in a group, whether it just be two or three people, again, you don't air out your laundry with everybody. But listen, because of that, listen, we find ourselves lacking the discipline that we need to be able to grow past that. And sometimes we need people in our life to help us navigate that. Because the brokenness and the damage that we have, have experienced, it has to be repaired. And the great news is we know God is the ultimate healer. Oh, man, isn't that awesome? God is. But there's times in the midst of that, you need somebody to walk along beside you and show you God in the flesh. It says, let me give you some comfort today. And out of that comfort is going to come some wisdom. And out of that wisdom, now I'm, going to, I'm going to move along beside you. I'm going to help you get repaired. I love what Job 4, 3 and 4 says. Job says, think how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. I love that. I love that. The, the, the Hebrew word there for strengthening, repair, support, it, it gives the idea, come on, Pastor Linda, it gives the ideas of strong hands supporting weak hands. Some of you that are caregivers for your parents or maybe a grandparent, you'll understand this illustration. Several years ago, when we had a young uh, a lady in our church, Miss Alice. Miss Alice loved me. She, she thought next to Jesus, I walked on water. And uh, she loved me. She didn't have any family. When she come to this church, she had the praise dance. I, I miss, she would just love to dance and worship. But as she got older and feeble, she couldn't care for herself. She fell. So we had to end up getting her into a facility. And we would go every almost every day to to be with her, Rhonda myself would, would go. And there was times in the latter part before her passing that uh, we would go help her eat. And, you know, the nurses, everybody wanted her to keep holding a spoon as long as she could. But what we would do, we would come along and take our strong hand and put that spoon in her and we'd help guide it into her mouth. And she still felt like she was feeding herself. But even though our hand was there to support. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. That's the picture that the Bible is giving us. That when we come along beside weaker people, we don't necessarily do everything for them. Because listen, if, if, you, if I want your deliverance and if I want your freedom more than you want it yourself, listen, that all I'm going to do is create somebody that, that, that becomes more dependent upon my prayers and my faith. Does that make sense? So I'm, I want to come along beside you. I, I want to strengthen you. I want to, I want to come along beside you. Jonathan came to David. When David was in a crisis, the Bible said Jonathan helped David find strength 
in God. That's what it was doing. So, so write this down. That allow God to touch you through whatever or whomever He desires. I love John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He what? Sent His only begotten Son, right? God loved the world. He sent Christ. But then in Paul, in 2 Corinthians 7 and 6, Paul said that God sent Titus. So it isn't either or. We need the Savior. We need Him to come. We need to accept salvation. But we also need the Titus. Titus come to Paul and strengthen Paul. In a time when Paul needed strength. And listen, there's some of us in this room. My challenge to you today is, what would happen to your life if you just simply allowed God to touch you through whatever or whomever He chooses to use? I love this last verse that is in Hebrew. It said, For we, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. In other words, this is not who Jesus is. Jesus is able. He's not unable. He's able to sympathize. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. I love that. You see, God became man. So God man, which was Jesus, what did God man Jesus do when he was here? You guess what he did? He touched people. He talked with people. He listened to people. He walked with people. He ate with people. He did, Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm the deity. I'm the son of God. I'm over here. You follow me? He went right to, that's what the church is. That's why we're here. Matter of fact, Jesus in the human flesh needed support because you read in Matthew 26 and 38 when he was in the garden of Gethsemane he, his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death and he asked Peter, James and John would you stay here with me and watch with me here is God man needing human support would you stay here with me and watch with me now we know the story Peter, James and John what did they do? they went to sleep but Jesus needed help. Guess what? We all need help. Amen? Amen? That's what the church is about. I want us to get ready this morning to close. I, I told you we, we were going to do everything. This one last verse in 2 John 12. John wrote this. He said, I have much to write to you, but I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead... I hope to visit and talk with you face to face so our joy may be complete. Anybody still like to get notes and cards? Anybody still like that? I, I know we have a generational gap that some of you, do, what, what's notes or cards? What, what, what is that? Anybody? But there's something about a handwritten note and they're neat. But let me tell you what. When you can see somebody face to face that you long to see. It's the reason why we tell people, hey, come to church on Sunday. Come on Thursday. Be here. Why? We need to see each other face. I love the fact that we have internet. I love the fact that hundreds of people watch us from all over the world. But there's nothing that can take the place of this face to face encounter. True? We have to work hard for this church. Why? Because God loves the church. He's building it. But we need each other to help us grow. We need each other to help us find comfort. We need each other for wisdom. And we need each other to help us repair some of the brokenness in our life. I, I, I want us to close today by just having communion together. I said we was going to do it all today. We've had... We had worship, we had baptism, we had prayer, we've had preaching, now let's have communion. I'm telling you, Jesus may come in the next few minutes, so just, just, just get ready. He may, we, we, we've done it all today, Lord. But there should be a communion cup behind you. For those of you that are sitting on the front row, Pastor Cody is going to come down here and serve you. 
I want you to take just a minute. We've got different ages. We've got different generations in this church. We've got, we still have some, some traditionists. We've got baby boomers. We've got millennials. We've got Gen Xers, Gen Zs. We've even got uh, Generation Alpha. Alpha is the next generation coming up. It's, it's, the, it's the Judas and, and the, and the um, other little children. I, we got some in. I can't remember all their names. But Austin, Austin's little, little girl. It's the, it's the Alpha generation that's coming up. So we're multi-generational. Honored today to have Pastor Daniel with us, with, with our Spanish family. There's different cultures in here. But listen, we serve the same God. When we, go to, when we get to heaven, there's just one church. And we're going to join that church, and we're going to be part of it. And we're doing everything we can to make the church's footprint in northwest Indiana as, as, as known and powerful. The, the impact that we have with all of our church. Listen, the only way we can do this is through each other. And I love the fact that communion brings us back to this moment of remembering Remembering his body, but also remembering the body of Christ. I want to read 1 Corinthians 11, and then I want to give you a chance just to, just to dedicate yourself and your, 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 your moment with God. Paul said, let's go over again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper. And why is, why is such a central, important part of our life? He said, the Master Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he took bread... Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the same thing, the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. So when we take these elements that we're about to do today, we're doing two things. Number one, we're remembering him. Communion brings us back to the cross, his sacrifice, his suffering. He died for us, the individual, but he also gave his life for the church. He died for the church. He loves the church. Communion is what reminds us that Christianity isn't about our works. It's not about what we've done. It's about what Christ has done on the cross. But when we join today in this communion, we're joining in in the biblical act around the world of sharing with every other believer, past present future that this covenant meal represents the fact that we serve a living God and he's building a great church amen Amen. and we have open communion at this church so you don't have to be a member of our church but I want you to take your elements and I want you to just bow your heads Pastor Lindsay is going to lead us in this song for just a minute and we're going to come to this table and then we're going to pray And then we're out of here. Come on. Would you do that? Go ahead, Pastor Lindsay. you just stand with me if you would I want you to take these two elements I appreciate the body of Christ I appreciate what God is doing I love our church I love the fact that we got people here that's challenging us to grow they're they're moving us in areas of life where we would find hopelessness and they're giving us comfort 
They give us wisdom. They, they help us navigate circumstances and situations. There's some of you in this room that, that are older. You, you need to find your Timothy. Make sure you look back and find people that's not as long as far as in the journey as you are and say, hey, how can I help you grow? How can I comfort you? How, what wisdom that you need? How can I help you be repaired and accept what God wants to do in your life? Some of you younger people, I challenge you. Don't, don't, don't keep looking at older people like, man, they don't know what I'm going through. You'd be surprised what some of us have went through. Hello? These gray hairs didn't come out of nothing. But you need to look and say, hey, listen, help me. Find, find somebody to say, hey, I need some guidance. I need some wisdom. And we want to comfort each other. And it, we, we come to these two elements every time we take communion. They remind us it wasn't easy for Christ to do what he did, but he did it. Right. It, was, it wasn't easy to go to that cross, but he did. He's in the garden. He's saying, God, if there's any other way, God, if there's, for somehow or another, you can call an audible. I'd appreciate it. Right? Come on. That's what he did. But he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And this bread represents his body. And this little cup represents his blood. From his body, from his blood, we have life, eternal life. But we also have the church. And Father, today, we take communion at Valpo, at Wadato, at North Judson, at Hebert. We take it as one family, Westfield. We bring it together, God. And God, we remember your great work, your great sacrifice. God, we remember what you're doing in Chicago. We remember what you're doing in our communities. God, we remember how you're using the church, which is your body. And God, today, Lord, we remember your sacrifice. And God, help us to give sacrificially of ourselves to each other, the body. And God, we thank you. And we receive this bread by faith. We receive this cup that represents your blood that cleanses us from all of our sins. And we remember you until you come. Receive the bread. join hands all the way across the building. I'm not going to ask you to come forward up in the mezzanine. Come on, just join hands. Will we just make one big one big line across here? Come on, just reach across the aisle. You may have to move a little bit. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Come on, those of you in the back, those of you in the back, move over. Come on, just join hands. Thank you, thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you in the mezzanine. Thank you, North Judson, Wanita, Hebron pastors. You guys, come on up. Do what you need to do. Listen, this is a great church. We're not a perfect church, but we're a healthy church. We're healthy because every one of you are saying, God, I appreciate what you're doing in my life. But I can't do it alone. It's not just me and Jesus. It's I need people in my life like this. And I want us today, as we close, I just want you to pray for that person to your right, to your left, and just say, God, help them grow. Help them find comfort. 
Help them get the wisdom that they need. Help them to be repaired from any brokenness in their life. Father, today, I ask you across this building, across our campuses, God, help us to grow. God, we don't want to get stale. We don't want to stay where we're at. God, we want to continue to grow in the knowledge of the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we can find the comfort that we need. God, the brokenness that may be represented here today. God, the hurt that is there, God, help us to be comforted by you and by the Holy Spirit and by each other. God, help us to get wisdom. God, please don't let us go alone. Let us ask for help. Let us get wisdom from wise counsel. And God, thank you for the repair that you're doing. God, I thank you that you're binding up the brokenhearted today. God, you're healing the downcast today. You're encouraging that person that is dealing with anxiety or fear, God. We're going to go out in this world today. And God, we're going to be a bridge builder to people around us. And let them know that there is a God and that he is doing great and awesome things. Come on, would you believe that right now? Just lift your hands and declare that now over our church. God, we declare that over our church.